It's my pleasure to welcome everybody to today's Target 2035 webinar. I still the number of colleagues joining is increasing. I would like uh, to start by introducing briefly the Target 2035 initiative. The goal of this initiative is to provide a pharmacological modulator for every protein in the human genome. This is an incredibly ambitious goal, as you will probably all agree to. That's why we created this seminar series to reach out to as many scientists as possible to join this effort. Today, uh, we will focus on the cell's waste disposal system, the field of targeted protein degradation. We have uh, invited six speakers from very diverse backgrounds who migrated into this field of research from the fields of synthetic organic chemistry, chemical biology, structural biology, epigenetics, and also from the deep trenches of medicinal chemistry. And we have probably one speaker who could claim to be uh, almost a native to this field from the beginning of her career. Um, we will have three talks, then we will have a 15-minute discussion, so we will collect questions for each speaker. Please use the Q&A function in uh, Zoom, and then we will have another three presentations, again collect the questions and have a joint Q&A at the end. Having said that, I would like to start to introduce the first speaker, which is Satpal Virdi. Satpal is a program, lead, a program leader at the Protein Phosphorylation and Ubiquitination Unit at University of Dundee. He has a deep background in structural biology and he will talk about using chemical biology approaches to unravel new E3 ligases and their mode of action. So please Satpal, the stage is yours. You're still on mute Satpal. Okay, thank you, Ingo. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Milka and the organizers for the kind invitation to allow me to share some of my lab's research with you today. So just to start off, I'm just going to give you a summary of E3 classification. So the vast majority of the hundreds of ligases are, are what we know as adapter-like E3s. These are facilitate direct transfer of ubiquitin from the charged E2 to substrate. And, and both E2 and E3 play an active role in, in substrate modification. Uh, there are, uh, these are adapter-like E3s are composed of hundreds of single polypeptide E3s and also multi-subunit E3s um, known as the Cullins. And to date, uh, at least the most mature targeted protein degradation um, technologies exploit adapter like E3s. But we shouldn't forget the cis E3s, which my lab is, is also interested in. Uh, there are about 45 of these. Um, they contain a catalytic cysteine forming a covalent intermediate with ubiquitin and transfer uh, ubiquitin to substrate autonomously. That is, the E2 is completely out of the picture at, at that step. And it was thought that these cis E3s are, uh, were composed of uh, about 28 and about 14 RBRs. So RBRs are ring between rings, like the adapter E3s, they contain a, a ring finger domain, but uh, this is catalytically inert and is linked to uh, a catalytic cysteine machinery. And we refer to RBRs as ring linked E3s. And I'm gonna introduce a new type of ring linked cis E3 that we call RCR or ring cis relay. So my lab is interested in the question, are there undiscovered E3 classes? And a number of factors suggest there are. Firstly, only a small fraction of ring finger E3s have been biochemically characterized. And as we know that ring, uh, ring finger domains can be linked to cysteine dependent machinery, it follows there might be undiscovered classes of ring linked E3 out there. Uh, secondly, there are known E3s with, with, with with characterized ligase activity, but we have no idea what the machinery is. They don't contain a ring finger domain, they don't contain a heck domain, for example. And uh, the proteins such as this are UBR4, UB20, and RNF213. And probably the most striking evidence of our ignorance is the fact that, me included, we all go around saying there are in excess of 600 E3s. 
until we can actually put a finite number on the number of E3s there are, I think it follows that our appreciation of E3 mechanistic diversity is going to be quite, quite weak. So the way we go about identifying new types of E3, it's, it's a chemical biology strategy we employ. And we develop activity-based probes for both adapter-like E3s, but also cis E3s, which is what I'm going to talk about here. We do this by re-engineering the ubiquitin charged E2 by inserting a cysteine reactive trap at the right position with the right reactivity profile. And then we can then append a reporter tag, such as a biotin or a fluorophore, for example. And if a cis E3 demonstrates hallmark cis E3 activity, and is indeed active, it becomes covalently labeled. And we can use this as a readout of uh, E3 activity in, in numerous sample types. So we've used these cis E3s to dissect E3 activation mechanisms and regulatory biology, uh, but we can do this in a systems-wide manner as well, using the biotin tag as the reporter and adding the probes to cell extracts and seeing what, what is actually binding to the probe. And without cis E3, this should be cis E3 ligases. And gratifyingly, we do enrich a large number of PECT and RBR E3 ligases. And what we're seeing on the y-axis here is just semi-quantitative quantification of, of a proxy of ligase activity. It's basically the number of peptides our probe is pulling out for all of these ligases. So this is quite valuable. We can sort of see what ligases might be activated in certain contexts. We can potentially use this to prioritize ligases for targeting with uh, pro uh, targeted protein uh, degradation uh, approaches. Um, so we were particularly interested in, in a, a ring uh, E3 ligase that was actually being enriched by our, by our probe, uh, MICBP2, which I've shown here. So this is a huge 500 kilodalton protein, which was believed to be an adapter like E3. We were also particularly drawn to this because people had shown that it, 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 it's a positive driver of this programmed axon degeneration pathway. So this is an in vivo sciatic nerve injury model and in a, and in a wild type background, after 10 days, the, uh, the axons in the sciatic nerve degenerate. Whereas in a conditional knockout background, after sciatic nerve injury, the axons are largely protected. I should point out that if this protein is constitutively knocked out, it leads to neural developmental phenotypes, which are actually perinatal lethal. This is because the protein is involved in, in neural development and lethality arises from uh, incomplete innovation of the diaphragm, so the, the mice that asphyxiate. So we used our, our probe suggested, this may contain ring-linked cis-dependent machinery and we took a C-terminal construct containing the ring domain and using this with our probe, we mapped the catalytic cysteine to C4520. We devised the ligase assay, although albeit unconventional, here we're adding E3 to ubiquitin charged E2. And when we add the E3, we can see it rapidly discharges uh, ubiquitin from E2. I should point out that if we do this experiment in the presence of BME, file reducing agent as is customary when loading a gel, it would look like a completely dead ligase and the project could have ended there. So whenever you're studying a novel class of ligase, always do with and without BME and look for a substrate independent activity or at least large substrate uh, in independent activity. Um, when we mutated the uh, cysteine we mapped, we lost this E3 mediated discharge. And we also saw something very strange because when, when we mutated a cysteine C terminal, uh, activity was partially uh, impaired, but we saw a, a stable, well, a, a hydroxide sensitive ubiquitin adduct forming. This led us to postulate that MICBP2 actually was indeed a new class of cis E3, but contained two catalytic cysteines and the second one might actually receive the ubiquitin molecule intramolecularly from the upstream one. Um, th these data suggested that there was a substrate present in the reaction based on the fact that the discharge was quantitative from E2. So we carried out mass spectrometry to see what that might be. And we saw that all of the ubiquitin was converted into two species, 
which corresponded to condensation products with glycerol and tris, which were both present in our buffer at commonly employed concentrations. Uh, glycerol does not contain an amine, it only contains hydroxy groups, telling us that MCBP2 has potent hydroxy esterification activity. To establish what the amino acid substrate might actually be, we tested model peptides and found that selectivity was potent towards threonine, uh, much more selective towards threonine and serine, and lysine activity was completely absent. I should point out we subsequently identified a poorly studied class of de-ubiquitinating enzymes that have uh, selective hydroxy esterase activity. So this kind of gives uh, support of the fact that non-lysine ubiquitination it's a highly regulated process in eukaryotes and may actually regulate uh, specific cellular, cellular functions. So we solved the crystal structure of this isolated C-terminal machinery. It contains the ring domain and it is indeed linked to this completely new protein fold in orange we call the TC domain. It contains both cysteines that we'd implicated in this relay mechanism, but the upstream one that accepts ubiquitin from E2 was in a completely disordered region. So this just shows that this tandem cysteine domain is a completely novel domain. It has this very peculiar zinc coordination, coordination pattern. And it's the only protein in humans that actually contains this domain. But the protein itself is conserved all the way down to, to worms, to C. elegans. Uh, despite the upstream cysteine being disordered, the downstream site was very well ordered. And that, that downstream cysteine that we'd shown accepts the ubiquitin biochemically was present and in proximity of a general base. We also saw a fortuitous packing interaction where a threonine peptide from the end terminus of a neighboring molecule was packed in, giving us insights into the structural basis for this very peculiar threonine uh, esterification activity. So the crystal structure didn't tell us how this novel ligase binds E2. It didn't tell us how the uh, um, ubiquitin is transferred from E2 to that disordered cysteine residue. So we thought, let's try and get a crystal structure of the E2-E3 transfer complex, and that might shed some light in, onto that. So these transfer intermediates are highly labile, so we turn to our activity-based probe to form a stable structural mimic of this, of this transient in, intermediate. So we did a bucket scale uh, reaction with our probe and our E3 construct, purified the protein, uh, isolated it, and Peter in my lab solved its structure. So the E2 binds the ring domain largely as expected, but unexpectedly, MCBP2 induces an activated folded back conformation of the ubiquitin E2 conjugate, something which was only thought to be uh, required by adapter-like E3 ligases. The upstream cysteine was now resolved, and it was seen to not be completely disordered, but adopts this transient helix. And the downstream cysteine was, like our APO structure, still resolved, but it clearly illustrated now the distance that would need to be traversed for this relay process to take place. This mediator loop carrying the first cysteine would need to deliver this ubiquitin cargo to this downstream cysteine somehow. So all of these things told us that MCBP2 actually has characteristics not only of ring finger uh, ligases, but also has hect characteristics and it also has characteristics of multi-subunit cullinine freaks. That's, that last inference is based on the fact that it uses an F-box protein as a substrate receptor to recruit its substrates. So how does the uh, ubiquitin get delivered to the downstream cysteine? Well, we saw that there was a helix being uh, induced upon transfer and there was a natural tendency for this to be disordered when not complexed with E2 ubiquitin conjugate. So we posited that perhaps this relay process is mediated by a, an entropically driven helix coil transition. And proline scanning, scanning experiments supported that model, and that's our current working hypothesis. We think it's important to understand how this relay, what the determinants and requirements are of intramolecular E3 relay, because I'm sure there are other E3s out there that also utilize this, this mechanism. So a burning question we had was, you know, we've discovered this new mechanism, RCR mechanism, biochemically and structurally characterized it, characterized it. Does it have anything at all to do with those neural phenotypes? So first of all, we checked, well, we developed a mouse model, first of all, where by CRISPR, we uh, mutated the upstream cysteine 
uh, to an unreactive alanine. So all aspects of RCR E3 activity were abolished, but the full length protein were, remained intact. So the neural developmental phenotype appeared to be recapitulated because unlike the HET background where neurite primary, primary neurite outgrowth was prolific, um, neurite outgrowth was significantly stunted in our heterozygous knock-in mouse model. This is quantified here. Neural development was also significantly impaired in vivo because we can see here the phrenic nerve is partially innovating the diaphragm relative to the heterozygous litimate. So we suspect that this point mutant knock-in is completely recapitulating those total knockout phenotypes observed. Um, but we wanted, to, we wanted to know what about that neuron, uh, sorry, the axon protective phenotype? Does loss of the RCR um, machinery confer axon protection? So we tested these stunted neurites for protection and strikingly we did observe significant protection. And we think this protection is masked because of the fact that the neurite outgrowth is, is so stunted. So we think if we could conditionally knock out RCR activity in an adult animal, once neurodevelopment has largely uh, been completed, the protective phenotype would be much more pronounced, such as, such as what we would see with uh, pharmacology. And we think inhibiting this RCR machinery could be a, a high value therapeutic strategy for treating a range of neurological disorders, such as chemotherapy induced neuropathies and potentially neurodegenerative diseases. So I hopefully I've convinced you that there are new E3 ligases out there that remain to be discovered. And it's important to do so because they may be implicated with disease areas of, of unmet clinical need. And if they are, if they do exist, they're likely to be quite rare. There aren't likely to be many homologues. So this could facilitate the development of selective modulators. And um, I'd just like to finish there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Satpal, very much for this beautiful lecture unraveling another mechanism which made nature evolve to transfer ubiquitin. And as mentioned before, so we will collect the questions until the um, roundtable discussion after three talks. So thanks again, uh, Satpal. You can already have a look at uh, one question waiting for you, but we will come to that later. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is going to be uh, Dirk Trauner from New York University. Dirk Trauner's background is in synthetic uh, organic chemistry, actually more specifically in natural product chemistry. But more recently, he more and more got enticed by the topic of photopharmacology, photo switches, and today we will hear about optical, optical control of protein degradation. Thanks, Inga. Um, thanks uh, to your colleague as well for inviting me to, to this meeting. Um, of course, I share with everybody else the excitement uh, about Protax uh, because of their beautiful catalytic mechanism and their occupancy-driven pharmacology. And given our background in photopharmacology, we, can, we just could not resist turning Protax into Photax. It's a case of acronym-driven research. We just needed to put in that extra control element of light uh, activatability and switchability. So what are we doing? We, are, uh, we have created uh, uh, product versions that have a ligand on one side uh, that uh, is inactive in the dark, but can be uh, irradiated and can be turned on uh, to become active. Uh, then the ternary complex can be formed. The uh, ubiquitination and polyubiquitation can take place, which of course, as you all know, leads to proteosomal degradation. And the photag would then turn over it could relax into an inactive form. It could be switched back actively into an inactive form and then turned on uh, using the uh, uh, unmatched temporal and spatial precision of light into the active uh, photog again. Uh, so the idea is to uh, uh, add an extra control element to the already high precision of targeted protein degradation. And how did we go about to design this? Well, of course, we took a look at the literature uh, we looked at uh, this compound, for instance, DP86, uh, introduced by Georg Winter and by, by Jay Bradner, uh, which links a, a ligand, or a ligand, I should rather say, in this audience, of, uh, for Cereblon to, uh, uh, to JQ1, uh, a ligand for PET proteins, BD234. And uh, when I squint my eye, I can see an azobenzene photoswitch everywhere. So we decided to uh, uh, 
uh, attach the photo switch on the side of the ligand for uh, for seroplon for the seroplon component of the E3 uh, ligase. Um, and the idea again was that this compound would be inactive in the transform of the azobenzene photo switch shown here, which is the dark adapted thermodynamically more favorable form. Whereas upon uh, photosomerization to the cis form, which currently requires uh, 390 nanometers light, deep violet light, it would, uh, it would uh, um, switch to the active form, to the pharmacologically active form. And then you could let it relax, which takes quite some time, as you will see in a minute, or you can push it back actively with a longer wavelength. One of the reasons why we wanted to have uh, the photo switch also on the side of the cerebron, uh, 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 on the cerebron side was because uh, my student Martin Reinders came up with this really beautiful synthetic approach, starting with a multi-billion dollar drug, lenalidomide, which undergoes uh, diazotization to make the diazonium ion, which then engages in a sophomore organic chemistry azo coupling uh, to put in the second azobenzene blade. We can then alkylate and deprotect and put in various linkers. So this is where the linkerology comes in largely. And at the end, uh, we add our uh, ligand for the protein of interest, which in this case, as I said, is um, a bet protein. Uh, so JK1 is the ligand. Uh, let's look at the, at the uh, uh, photostationary states. So photo switches are associated with photostationary states. Uh, they are not really 100% on and off. But we can actually switch it to the active form with 80, 400 nanometers light with violet light uh, pretty uh, extensively. So to the tune of uh, 90, 10, uh, perhaps even more. And uh, then we can push it back to the inactive form, uh, but with light, not completely because the photostationary states are about 80, 20 at longer wavelength at green light, uh, 500 nanometers. The compound also relaxes very slowly. So for all intents and purposes, these are bistable photo switches. It actually takes 33 hours in PBS buffer uh, half-life of 33 hours uh, to, uh, to go backwards. Now let's look at the Western plots. Uh, 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 and as you can see, uh, degradation of BRD4 uh, uh, in the duct does not take place over a wide concentration range from 10 nanomolar to 10 micromolar, we see nothing. But if we start pulse irradiating in RS4-11 cells, uh, pulse irradiating means uh, every 10 seconds for 100 milliseconds, a flash of light you see very nice degradation kicking in about 100 nanomolar, 300 nanomolar, one micromolar. Uh, the uh, bed protein BRD4 is completely gone. And this uh, works even nicer uh, with BRD3. But before I get there, I want to quickly throw in that, of course, we also see the, the hook effect uh, that at uh, very uh, large concentrations, uh, the protein comes back because uh, the, both sides are saturated. So the hook effect, the hallmark of uh, a product is also present. Uh, let's look at BRD3. As I said, uh, it works even nicer with BRD3, uh, if you will. Uh, BRD2 can also degrade, be degraded in a, in a uh, uh, light dependent fashion. And downstream, of course, for BRD4, we see the effect on CMUC. Uh, when we look at the time course uh, uh, with BRD4 now, uh, we observe that after three hours, six hours, the protein is largely gone upon pulse irradiation. Whereas in the dark, uh, there is no effect as, as before. And uh, BRD3, interestingly, uh, uh, is removed uh, faster uh, after about one and a half hours. We see little left of BRD3. And as I said before, uh, pleasingly, we see an effect on CIMIC that uh, infamously undruggable target, which is, of course, one of the reasons that people are excited about bread pet protein, because the control expression of uh, the cancer driver CIMIC. We also see at some point cleft, uh, cleft part one as an indicator of apoptosis. And that we knew already because the very first experiment we always run in photopharmacology or in this type of photopharmacology are live dead assays. And when I saw this curve, I knew we are in business because clearly this compound is less toxic uh, in the dark than it is upon pulse irradiation. You have a nice photopharmacological window, uh, let's say the micromolar or uh, the fractions of a micromolar. Um, it's not very wide, this photopharmacological window, but it's certainly uh, serviceable. We would like to uh, widen it by making compounds that are more potent as degraders after irradiation, or which are actually less important as inhibitors in the dark. The reason why this compound is still toxic is because we're still dealing with uh, a JK1 uh, version that inhibits uh, uh, and not only the, leads to degradation. But of course, by making less potent inhibitors, uh, which are uh, uh, however potent as degraders, as many uh, instances in literature already suggest that this can happen, uh, we can widen this window. And we'll see some cases where this is indeed uh, a little bit wider. 
This is, by the way, the cell disco, as we call it, that uh, 96, so in this case, 24 LED array on top of which we put our, our cell culture plates. Uh, and then we do our, uh, our live data assays with this. So we can control this pulse irradiation with an Arduino computer. It's technically quite easy to run these photopharmacological experiments. Um, uh, color dosing is another interesting aspect of photo switches because the photostationary states are a function of the, um, of the uh, wavelength. And as you can see here, um, uh, through 90 nanometers, we see uh, maximum degradation, whereas when we go to different wavelengths, we see different amounts of degradations. And that actually very nicely matches the photostationary states that we have determined with UVBs. Um, uh, we also see this at the level of live dead assays as we go from dark to green to cyan uh, to uh, violet, we see increasing toxicity uh, due to increasing degradation. We can also run a rescue experiment to demonstrate reversibility. Uh, so when we irradiate and then uh, switch off the light, uh, the active form, uh, sorry, the inactive form rather comes back rather slowly, uh, uh, takes some hours uh, to come back uh, after three hours, uh, there's still massive degradation uh, observed. Whereas if you push it back to the inactive form with green light with 525 nanometers, this goes uh, faster. Uh, and of course, we are still working on photo switches that can be, uh, be pushed back completely. We're also working on photo switches that are redshifted, the action spectrum of which is more towards the red end of the spectrum. Stay tuned for those. We have some data already on this. How general is this concept uh, of uh, photox? I would argue as general as the concept of protox. Uh, we, in our first paper, uh, made the photox versions, seropon targeting photox versions of non protox including one that targets uh, FKPP12. Uh, and indeed, uh, we see very nice degradation of FKPP12 in a light dependent fashion. Uh, and that, of course, uh, uh, also has the time course, uh, has a time course uh, you see after 12 hours. Uh, this is largely gone, but of course, this also means that FKPP12, FKPP12 mutant star tagged proteins uh, could be degraded, uh, adopting the D tag uh, logic. Uh, we are actually quite excited about this because this would open a new avenue in optogenetics from our perspective, a field that we helped to uh, start and uh, that is still very dear to our heart. Uh, I could now show you a couple of other photox. Uh, uh, suffice it to say that we have made about a dozen now, and most of them actually do lead to light dependent degradation. A very nice one is one for MDM2. So we see a very nice photopharmacological window in this case. We also have some really nice data on CDK4.6. Uh, stay tuned for this. Uh, we're currently uh, finalizing the biological experiments uh, uh, that uh, involve this, in my opinion, rather useful tool. But I'm also very excited about adopting uh, photox for neuroscience because chemical neuroscience really is my background, my scientific background. And recently we have been able uh, to demonstrate that a photox for ChemK2, a kinase that is critically involved in synaptic strength formation and in memory formation uh, works. Uh, we can actually interrogate this at the level of, um, of uh, slices, of brain slices and see that synaptic strength uh, measured by excitatory field potentials um, uh, um, uh, post-synaptic potentials, uh, field potentials measured, uh, that this uh, works quite beautifully uh, upon irradiation. We see decrease in synaptic strength, whereas if we don't irradiate, if we just uh, 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 irradiate in the absence of the compound, we see a flat line. So again, a case where I think uh, there's huge opportunities for products in neuroscience for basic research tool, including the genetically tagged ones I was alluding to before. How do they work? Uh, well, uh, maybe, uh, Nicola can tell us how they work. Uh, we actually believe uh, that uh, uh, the cis activity of our compounds we understand uh, because we, when we take a look at iberimide, at this pencil phenyl ether uh, bound to cereblon, which of course is a type of molecular glue, uh, but also mimics our, our, our photoc architecture. We can see that uh, replacement of these two atoms with a diazine unit. Um, uh, it makes sense, and uh, the conformation of iberimide bound to cerebron actually mimics a cis azobenzene, and therefore we believe we understand why our compounds are cis active, but more detailed biophysical measurements uh, will be necessary, uh, which uh, hopefully all will also will be funded. I just wrote the grant on this. And just uh, to conclude, uh, of course, this also opens an avenue to photoswitchable molecular glue, uh, to foemids, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, my students have already. Uh, 
uh, demonstrated that this works. We can actually degrade Icarus in a light dependent fashion. We're equally excited, by the way, uh, about the possibility that the neo substrate profile will change with light. So stay tuned for that. That will require some, uh, some photomics measurements, but it's certainly something that is our, on our to do list and is largely done at this point, uh, to a certain extent done. With that, I would like to thank my students. I mentioned Martin, Brian Matsura was also involved together with our friends at NYU Biochemistry, Michele Pagano, Antonio Marzio, Daniele Simoneschi, and a more recent uh, 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 generation of students, uh, Chris Mark, uh, Arp, I mentioned, and Tom Coe, as well as Marlene Barut, who have joined the effort, uh, generously funded so far by NYU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Very illuminating. And I think we will all agree that the application space for, for this approach is, is huge. So thinking about the many targets which you can then switch on and switch off with a small molecule. Um, as before, so we're going to collect the questions. Um, some questions will be answered as we go ahead. And then we will uh, pick up some remaining questions in the Q&A after the third talk. Um, our next and third speaker in this first session is Fleur Ferguson. And um, as mentioned before, one could uh, see Fleur as a native in the field of uh, structure-based design of probes and more recently of degraders. Going back to her time in Cambridge with Chris Abel and Alessio Chuli, and more recently with Nathaniel Gray at the Dana Farber. And today we're going to hear about the degradable Kino. Thank you so much for the introduction. Really excited to be taking part in this webinar series and telling you about our experimental um, map of the degradable kinone. Um, and so today I'm going to um, tell you about some of the current practices and current challenges in developing targeted protein degraders. Um, and then um, describe our experimental approach for creating a resource to help us um, accelerate targeted protein degrader discovery um, and I'll show a few examples of how this data set, which is now available publicly online and in our publication, um, can be used to um, accelerate your programs. And then in the second part, I'll talk about how some of the molecules we discovered in part one um, can be leveraged to help us examine the effects of chemical and cellular variables on targeted protein degradation outcomes across a significant portion of a gene family. So we're all familiar with targeted protein degradation, and I think many of us, in particular the chemists who are watching, are familiar with some of the challenges that developing a potent and selective and fast-acting degrader can pose. And so we see beautiful stories in the literature of the success stories, but um, we all know that this is kind of an empirical process. Um, and one of the reasons is there are just so many variables and it's a new field we're still learning about. And so um, all of these um, different components can have dramatic effects on the activity of your compound, including what kind of a binder do you use, what's the binding mode, what's the exit um, vector, uh, all of these linker variations, which now is its own linkerology field, um, the choice of ligase, and, and also, you know, perhaps target intrinsic properties, such as availability of lysines or cell-specific factors. And so, um, you know, it's been described by leaders in the field that this resource intensive discovery phase of getting those small molecule probes, which is what um, in target 2035, I think we're all excited about, um, uh, is a real hindrance to the broad adoption of targeted protein degradation. And so early work um, into finding the low hanging fruit and understanding target tractability um, was done in both Nathaniel Gray and Craig Cruz's lab in these two beautiful chemical biology papers where multi-targeted kinase inhibitors that biochemically can bind to perhaps 200 um, different kinases uh, were transformed into degraders. Um, and when we treat cells with these molecules, um, shown here for this desmethoxy TAA684 scaffold, um, for short time points, we can see about 25 kinases are significantly down-regulated. And we hypothesized these would be low-hanging fruit for targeted degradation. And indeed, armed with this knowledge, the Gray Lab and others have managed to rapidly develop chemical probes in the form of protax um, for a large number of these highlighted kinases. Um, and so this really uh, motivated us to expand our efforts and expand our list to create a broad, broad map of kinase degradability um, and perhaps try and understand why some kinases are more tractable than others and what we can do to increase our chances of developing active and selective probes. And so um, what we did was we uh, used the vast amount of knowledge of kinase binders that's out there. We took 
FDA approved drugs, we looked in the patent literature, the academic literature, and we also took in-house data from um, the Gray Lab Kinase collection to develop a library of degraders that really uh, surveys a broad number of chemotypes for binding to kinases, making sure to include those different binding modes again, a broad range of linkers. Um, and in this study, we focused primarily on cerebellum and BHL recruiting degraders. And so it would be very interesting um, to expand these efforts. And as we continue um, with with this type of approach to include some of the newer E3 ligase ligands that are being described today and are being developed at the moment. Okay, so we took our library and we put all of those compounds through a cellular permeability screening in the form of an E3 ligase target engagement assay um, and also looked for the permeable compounds for chemical similarity because we wanted to survey as diverse a chemical space as possible. Uh, so we took around 91 compounds um, and performed mass spectrometry based global proteomics analysis at a short time point to help make sure that we're really only looking for direct degradation events and hopefully minimizing our chances of finding secondary or downstream events. Um, we were really pleased to find um, hits from all clades of the kinome tree, as you can see over here. So it doesn't look like any particular type of kinase um, is not degradable. Uh, so in, among protein kinases, we found 172 degradable kinases, um, so a significant proportion of the detected kinome, which we were really excited about. Um, and happily, we were able to rediscover the vast majority of kinases that have been described to be degradable in the literature, as well as add a huge number um, of newly degradable kinases to that list. And so um, we think of protein kinases as this list of 518 um, kinases, but of course there are non-protein kinases such as lipid and metabolic kinases, pseudokinases, and so these have recently been compiled in this nice bioarchive paper um, from the Silver Lab. So we actually looked more broadly in our data set at the extended kinome, and we're pleased to find around 40 additional hits um, for these metabolic lipid and pseudokinases. Um, and then finally, what we did was we took the list of the NIH's understudied kinases. So these are kinases where there is little known about the mechanism and the substrates, and there are no selective chemical probes. And so I would imagine these would be also on the hit list for target 2035, because we really don't have the tools to study them properly. Um, and we were really pleased to find that we had hits for at least 16 of these understudied kinases, and that many of them were actually highly degradable. And so one nice example is this um, degrader here shown um, on the right. And so this is a dibrafenib based degrader, which is of course a multi-targeted kinase inhibitor, but it's actually relatively selective um, for CDK17. And I think this highlights some of the values an experimental approach can bring where we would never have guessed to begin from dibrafenib, but now we have this nice lead um, that we can optimize using medicinal chemistry. Um, and so in the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna show a couple of examples about how the data in this database um, can be used to accelerate um, protect discovery programs. So one of the first things we did was we went back to that question of kinase degradability. Um, and we looked at uh, what is the degradability of each kinase and we guessed this or we approximated this as how many times is this kinase degraded by a unique molecule. Um, and we hope that this could function a little bit like ligandability functions um, when developing small molecule inhibitors. What we found that there were a number of kinases that were highly degradable. And one of these kinases is Aurora kinase A. And so armed with this knowledge, we're able to take an already described selective inhibitor of Aurora kinase A and transform it into a degrader, this one recruit Cerebon. Um, what we found was potent and selective degradation of Aurora A. This validated by Western blood. Um, it's very potent at short time points uh, with the DC, DC90 around 125 nanomolar. And importantly, this displays differentiated pharmacology. And so in a viability assay in the MM1S cell line, we can see this nice IC50 curve for our degrader, whereas that cell line is relatively resistant to the inhibitor. The second um, thing you can do is, is decide your target from the beginning, um, come what may with degradability. Um, and so one example of this is CSK, which is an interesting kinase um, involved in sting pathway signaling for which there is no selective chemical probe. Um, we took a look at all of the hits in our database and identified quickly this molecule DB3291. This has a really nice um, proteomics profile, again, relatively selective for CSK, so a great advanced lead point for medicinal chemistry. Um, and again, we wouldn't have been able to come up with this um, using a, a kind of de novo or uh, just sitting down and thinking about it because there aren't those chemical probes out there for these kinases. Um, so we were excited about this. Um, 
However, okay, now we have all these fantastic leads that we're really excited about, um, but uh, what about actually optimizing them? Um, this is the tricky part. And so we decided to use some of the more multi-targeted probes that we had found um, to see if we could interrogate the effects of chemical and cellular variables and TPD outcomes with statistical rigor. Um, so many of the hypotheses out there, they come from one target series. So one chemical scaffold, one target, one cell line, and they're not always applicable um, to every program. So what we did was we simulated computationally um, which combination of four molecules would allow us to interrogate the most kinases. Um, and identified these four compounds on the right, which can together degrade over 120 kinases. So now we can, in just four experiments, look at almost a quarter of this gene family. So the first thing we looked at was cellular target engagement. Um, of course, cellular target engagement is um, described to be less important for degraders because of this substoichiometric mode of action, but we just wanted to understand um, what does that actually look like. Um, and so we took our four compounds and performed global proteomics analysis after a five hour treatment. This is a standard TMT based proteomics experiment. Um, but then we took the malt four cell line, which we'd used for proteomics. Um, we knocked out CRISPR using, uh, sorry, we knocked out Cerebron using CRISPR gene editing. Um, and then we performed a kinative experiment where we treated um, under matched conditions. And instead of performing proteomics, we used this chemoproteomic assay to look at cellular target engagement across the kinome. And so if we plot this for just one um, of our degraders here, what you can see is that there are actually um, a distribution of situations where many of the degraded kinases are indeed significantly engaged in the cell. However, um, some of the engaged kinases are not degraded and some of the kinases which are not engaged are indeed degraded. If we look at that for all four cell lines, you can see the distribution kind of looks like this, where for many compounds, there is actually significant target engagement. Of course, you can't think about target degradation and cellular target engagement without thinking about those important ternary complexes. And so again, we wanted to understand what's the relationship between rapid degradation, we're at a five hour time point, and um, abundant stable ternary complexes. And so again, we took this time a HEC293T cell line, um, performed our standard proteomics experiment. Then we took a cell line which expresses flag type cerebron, treated it with a proteasome inhibitor and our small molecule degraders. Um, and performed affinity, um, affinity purification to identify kinases that are enriched for binding to cerebron upon addition of our small molecule degraders. And again, if we look at this for just one example, what you can see on the left is global proteomics analysis and also a rank order plot for that um, a APMS experiment. Um, and interestingly, there are indeed degraded kinases which form stable ternary complexes, but many of the degraded kinases we cannot detect a stable ternary complex for. Um, and something that's not really discussed very often, but that we saw um, quite prevalently in our experiment is that we saw a lot of non-productive ternary complexes. So we found a ternary complex, but it didn't lead to degradation, which of course makes sense because you may not have those lysines, you may not have the right orientation, um, but for something we don't really think about too much when we're uh, like thinking about our assay workflow for developing degraders, for example. And so that was what um, the kind of distribution looked like for all the targets for these four molecules, where you can see actually most of them don't form these highly abundant complexes, um, consistent with a catalytic mode of action where you can get degradation from a very rapid and transient um, interaction. Uh, so one of the other things that's really important is understanding the ligase compatibility. If you are not getting that complex, however transient it may be, then you're not getting degradation. Um, and so there's been a number of examples at the time of small molecules uh, degraders that were only able to be active when one ligase but not the other ligase was used. So we wanted to look at what does this look like? How many targets have a real E3 ligase preference? Um, how many of them are relatively agnostic to the E3? Um, so what we did was we created matched pairs with the same linker and the same kinase binding pharmacophore, um, but with the different uh, E3 recruiting ligands. Um, and what you're looking at here is the fault protein abundance fold change um, for these two molecules shown at the top. Uh, and you can see that there are very, very clear um, subsets that have a ligase preference, um, but there are also many that lie along that diagonal that are able to be equally degraded. And so if we look across um, all of the match pairs that we ran, we can see the vast majority can be degraded by either cerebron or VHL, that's great news, but there are some that cannot be degraded um, by one ligase or the other. And this preference held true across our broader data set. And so I think um, what's really encouraging is that, you know, the number of degraded ligases from just, just these two molecules or just 
just the uh, six pairs that we ran, sorry, uh, was expanded by almost 20% by addition of an extra E3 ligase. And so that I think really provides a motivation for finding ligands for new E3 ligases um, to potentially expand uh, the target space for targeted protein degradation. Uh, so we looked at many other variables and there's no time in this talk to go through all of them, but I encourage you to check out our paper. We also looked at linkerology, we looked at um, cellular context and we looked at target expression levels. Um, but I wanted to show this last slide where, um, you know, the whole of this study was really focused on the medicinal chemistry aspect of creating chemical probes, creating new um, degrader molecules. But what we realized was that we actually, uh, with these four compounds that can, uh, redirect a, rapidly a huge proportion um, of the kinome towards the ubiquitin proteasome system, we had this unique opportunity to study that system itself um, and ask basic biological questions. And so we were really interested in, um, in this last experiment for using those tools to interrogate the role of the unfoldase P97 um, in targeted protein degradation of kinases. So P97, it's poorly understood why um, or what makes a protein um, require or depend on P97 uh, for its degradation. Uh, so what we did was we took our multi-targeted compounds shown here again for just one of those on the left um, and treated them uh, either in concert with a P97 inhibitor or alone. Um, and what we found was that the vast majority of degradation for um, most of the kinase targets was indeed P97 dependent. Um, and if we just treat with the P97 inhibitor alone, those target levels do not change. So taken together, this suggests that actually P97 is playing an essential role in handing over these substrates to the proteasome, which we thought was exciting um, and kind of opens the door for asking uh, additional questions about P97 and about the ubiquitin proteasome system. Um, and so just to, just to wrap up on this, um, quick tour of our resource. Uh, we created an open access resource of degrader hits and whole protein profiles for 220 different kinases. Uh, we quantified the cellular and chemical variable effects on TPD outcomes, uh, which we hope can be used to guide uh, medicinal chemistry approaches. Um, and we use these multi-targeted degraders as tools to uncover a dependency on the P97 ATPase for targeted degradation of kinases. Um, Eric Fisher's lab also created this fantastic web tool um, that you can use to replot the data, change the cutoffs, create your own heat maps, um, and search by either compound or your favorite kinase to see what those hits look like and what those leads might look like if you are interested in beginning a kinase degrader program. Um, so please, um, I encourage you to take a look at this, no bioinformatics um, background required. Um, and I have to acknowledge so many people for this uh, project and presentation. I even resorted to pictures because there wasn't enough space on the slides, um, but this was a massive team effort from chemists in the Gray Lab and Tabo Sims Lab, and then all of the biochemists um, in Eric Fisher's lab, and in particular, Catherine Donovan, who co-led this study with me. Um, this was a really, really um, exciting team effort to be a part of. Um, finally, a shameless plug, I just started my independent research group at UC San Diego. I'm recruiting for postdocs, in particular in the cell biology area. So if you're excited about learning more or you think you might want to join the team, this is my contact information. Um, I'd also like to thank you all for your, in, uh, your attention and I'm happy to take questions in the upcoming Q&A session. Thank you, Flora, very much for this tour de force and I think it's safe to say that this data set will influence uh, many many studies to come. Also thanks for reminding us how nice the area around San Diego is. So speaking from winter in Central Europe. Um, so um, Satpal and Dirk already covered some of the questions in the Q&A so maybe we start with Fleur. So there, there was a question around selectivity, how selectivity transfers. I would turn this question around. So is there an emerging understanding what are the real tough nuts to crack? So let's say kinases, you thought we have them well covered with lots of inhibitors, but you didn't see in your degradation results. Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. This is something our reviewers asked us as well, um, was um, you know, how can we understand those, um, those not degraded kinases, because of course there are um, more than 220 kinases out there. And so what we did was we took a look at some of the kinases um, that, that we found were not degraded, but were detected in our experiments. So they were perhaps, they were bound, um, they formed a ternary complex and so on. Um, and some of those kinases were very, very highly expressed. So uh, we were wondering if that was perhaps an artifact of our short time points. 
um, or if that was actually something to do with uh, the fact that it's quite challenging to turn over that much protein um, and keep up with the protein resynthesis. Um, so, so that was one of the things we identified, um, but we also did go through and kind of uh, look at those examples and sort of list out what those properties are. And it's not, it's not exactly clear what the rules are um, for when something would be not degraded, although we found um, th three examples um, that, that stood out to us where, where we saw nice detection, nice engagement. Um, but I think uh, having these large data sets will help us to uh, kind of team up with biochemists, team up with um, bioinformatics folks to see if as we add more data, because of course three examples isn't too many, as we add more data, can, can we start to understand that a little bit better? Um, in particular, as we start to understand things like lysine availability, things like cellular localization that, that we haven't probed in this project, um, maybe we can, we can gain an understanding. So that was one of our goals. And I think we sort of haven't fully answered it, but we're um, beginning to collect data to hopefully get us on the way. Thank you. I think there was a follow-up question from Cheryl. So do you see something like a, a link to the number of lysines in the, in the surface of, of uh, the kinases in question, or is this more, is it still too early to go into that detail? So, so we actually didn't map that. Um, of course, there's 500 kinases. Many of them are crystallized thanks to efforts from the SGC. Um, but that was um, a lot of um, computational power that we would need to build all of those models and look at all of those structures and look at the surface lysine. So we haven't done, um, we have done neither the docking analysis nor the surface lysine orientation analysis to, to tell us, you know, where are those lysines relative to the complex. And um, that's something we'd be really interested in doing or potentially teaming up with a computational group to do. But like I said, at least, at least that data is there. So now you can build a model around that, uh, that data, which might help us understand um, that, but I agree that's something that we thought was important but we just didn't um, we, we just didn't put in this first paper. Okay. Um, Dirk, although you have answered this question already, I think it's a question many of the, the colleagues in, in the presentation had. So what about going to the in vivo stage with your photo switchable um, protex? Can you maybe share some thoughts about that? As a, as a road, I think this is fairly straightforward. Uh, you have to distinguish two sort of uh, directions. One is for therapy, the other one is for research purposes. And I think for research purposes, uh, this is quite quite uh, doable because we're essentially doing what you do in optogenetics, right? You, uh, you, uh, or in chemogenetics for that matter. You, uh, you uh, inject the compound and then you irradiate uh, and the technologies to do that in a live uh, rodent behavioral assay are absolutely worked out. So we think for neuroscience applications, the adaptation of uh, photax, um, both with and without genetic encoding, genetic tagging, will be very straightforward. In fact, we are working on this already. Uh, as for uh, uh, therapy uh, and the cancer targets I was alluding to, uh, CDK4-6 and the bed proteins themselves, uh, we think that the most uh, obvious uh, target is lung cancer, is non-small cell lung cancer, where many of these, uh, uh, of these uh, targets are drivers. And where light delivery is also straightforward uh, because bronchoscopy and also to a certain extent photodynamic therapy is routinely used, especially in stage one non-small cell lung cancer. So we think that the uh, precision that light affords again and the avoidance of systemic side effects uh, could be demonstrated uh, here. But of course, I'm very interested to hear about other, uh, other uh, diseases, uh, these uh, functions where, uh, where uh, light delivery is conceivable uh, and as I said in my talk already, we are working on longer wavelengths that are more cell penetrant. Although blue light is actually not that bad. Violet and blue light is not that bad if you want to go in a few millimeters or fractions of a millimeter. It also depends on the intensity of the light you're using. But we, we have designs and already results on uh, redshifted and even far redshifted photox. Thank you, Dirk. So one of the options always from these webinars is also to, to trigger some, some thoughts by people joining and then reaching out with, with ideas or follow-up questions. Um, I would uh, briefly address also a question to Satpal, uh, which is related to one question you addressed already. So many people with a drug discovery background in this webinar. So what about taking the next step with MUC-BP2, drugging MUC-BP2? So what would be your thoughts about this? Also looking at your 
your essay set up, wouldn't this be something one could directly use for that? Yeah, yes, yes and yes. Um, so yeah, we're very uh, excited about the possibility of, of pharmacologically targeting MCPP2. Um, it's a positive uh, driver of this uh, axon degeneration pathway. And there's another downstream driver known as SARM1, and that's attracted a lot of uh, interest from the from pharma um, since it was uh, since it was realized that it actually is an enzyme. It has NADA's activity, so it can be drugged. We think MCPP2, you know, we now know it's a there are two cysteines, there are potentially pockets uh, that could be targeted. You know, it's potentially opens the two cysteines open up the possibility of um, covalent inhibition and um, and yes the probe in principle the our activity based probe could be used as a simplified assay platform where we can just have probe and e3 and look for small molecules that disrupt probe labeling without having to have the e1 free ubiquitin atp and substrate present uh, in the a caveat with with that using the probe though with micbp2 is that the probe only assesses the upstream active site. So it only measures E2, E3 ubiquitin transfer or, or E2 binding. Um, any inhibitors that might be directly targeting the downstream site, uh, our probe would not be sensitive to that. So that, that, that's a caveat where you know, a two-pronged approach, at least for MCPP2, would be, would be required where you, you might use the probe and also a classic E1, E2, E3 reconstitution so that the entire okay. activity is, is, uh, is assayed. Thank you, Satpal. I would briefly open it also for the colleagues um, speaking in the next session. So I'm seeing a question from Chris Desavi around Fleur's comment um, uh, regarding unproductive ternary complexes. So Chris, go ahead. Hi, Fleur. Um, sorry, I, I can't access the Q&A. I'm just wondering, I was really interested in unproductive ternary complexes and just your views on that. And I'm just wondering, do you think unproductive ternary complexes being turned into productive ternary complexes is just a med chem exercise or is it, or is it biology as well? I, I, I'm not trying to be funny and ask it, but do you think we're able to turn this around with just, you know, modifying the linkers, potentially modifying the the ligands to, to turn them into more productive. Is it just med chem or is it biology as well? Oh, we're, how, how I would think about this or how I, I am thinking about this is that, um, you know, it's poorly understood um, at the moment, uh, you know, why certain ligands are great, make great um, recruiting handles for uh, protax and why others may not. You can see many examples in our data, of, for example, equipotent, binders uh, where one degrades and one does not for the same protein. And so how we think about this is that, you know, if we have this experimental data set where we can see a list of all the kinase scaffolds, for example, all the linkers, all of the molecules that have been tested in proteomics, and we get this list of active ones, um, that we know they can form a productive ternary complex. And then perhaps you could optimize ternary complex uh, formation to, to improve those properties. Um, but you will have this big advantage because you don't have to uh, kind of guess, make, test um, to find those uh, ligands that can that can recruit the kinase in the right orientation or with the right um, kind of affinity. And so um, I would say that we, you know, there's no prescription for this is the best ligand for this kind of kinase, but, um, but having a, a library or a data set where you can kind of skip some of that and you can kind of skip some of the this binds and this forms a complex, but it doesn't degrade, um, could be a real advantage for um, kind of jump-starting some programs. So that's how we hope that, that this database can be useful in the context of, of that kind of question. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I'm just wondering when we get to positions and, you know, where we, you know, can't form those ternary complexes, whether that tells us, you know, not to work on those sort of targets or, or, you know, saying that this is going to be unproductive. I mean, uh, here, at, here at Chimera, what's, what's pretty interesting, and I, I won't be able to talk about this today, but we've, uh, you know, looked at some targets where actually for quite a while we were unable to form um, ternary complexes in with quite a bit of optimization. 
we were able to, especially on targets, people felt you couldn't degrade. And then we've been able to show ubiquitination, but then not degradation for, for quite some time. And then again, with further optimization and again, using sort of like the alpha Lyser ternary complex assay, we've been able to kind of measure quantitatively that alpha Lyser signal, um, optimize and increase for it and then eventually see degradation. We didn't realize how difficult that would be, but there's some targets that, as, as I'm sure you know, that just don't, I mean, even outside of the kinome that are very difficult to degrade. Um, and then it's just, especially for us being a small company, it's actually working out, you know, when when do you continue optimizing and when do you stop? And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's really, really hard, especially when you're having to make sort of progress quite fast and, um, and especially on some target proteins, which, you know, there's literature out there saying, well, hey, these are going to be difficult to degrade, but actually, in fact, you can degrade them. It's just, it just becomes a, a you know, a longer optimization um, process. That's more a comment. It wasn't a question, actually, but it's, it, it's, it's no, always, I think, it makes, actually. I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's um, sort of reassuring to hear that, well, I'm sorry to hear, but it's also kind of reassuring to hear that you also have seen these differences in intrinsic degradability. And, and that's what we hope to do with this kind of map was, was kind of figure that out, at least for the kinome is, uh, you know, if you want to take on this protein, excellent plan to have a rough ride or plan for it to work quickly, um, can maybe help inform priorities or inform resources, uh, kind of allocation. So um, I don't know what targets you're working on, but hopefully as we expand efforts into different gene families, maybe we can, um, maybe we can uh, start to understand that beyond the kinome too. Okay, thanks. Flo. I think Chris, it was a very important comment because it's probably a bit underappreciated that there are these tough nuts out there and it's not always just take the two molecules and put a pack linker in between. So I think we as a field also need to start doing some expectation management in this direction because usually those, those, those results are, are not reported. And I see Dirk um, uh, smiling. So there are probably also some examples where uh, people in his lab went after Fotex and uh, this didn't end up to be that straightforward. I like the, I like the expression expectation management. I need to adopt that. Okay, so I see Nico is getting a bit nervous because he fears that we uh, continue with the discussion and just take it from his presentation slot, but that's not going to be the case. So Fleur, thanks again. Thanks again, Sapal, Dirk. For Fleur, there are quite a number of questions still in the Q&A. Maybe you can have a look at them and, and try to answer them in the Q&A. And, and we would head on to the um, second uh, session today. And there, our first speaker will be Nico Tome from the Friedrich Miescher Institute in Basel. So uh, structural biology uh, background. Um, and I don't think I have to introduce Nico to this audience and will just say, so Nico, please explain to us what makes the glue a glue. Yeah, if I only know. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction, Ingo. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, share with you some of our recent thoughts on how these systems work. And, and um, as, as Ingo told you, we really come to this from a structural biology point of view. And, and um, in, in my line of work, when we look at protein complexes in particular, looking how these complexes are affected by disease, the mutations, one typically sees a lot of things breaking. And what brought us to this field of molecular glues is this concept that the drug can infer um, a glue-induced neo-function, something really a gain of function induced by a small molecule. And we were really curious to see how this works. And the system we chose um, to look at this uh, was really pioneered by, um, by the Handa lab and subsequently by Bill Kalen, Ben Ebert, and Raj Chopra when he was at cell gene and has to do with these immunomodulatory drugs that um, Dirk already introduced to you, the, the imits and thalidomide, pomalidomide and lenalidomide most like, most, uh, mostly for this talk. And their ability to be really powerful drugs uh, for the degradation of Icarus iolos in, in multiple myeloma and casein kinase one alpha in 5Q myodysplastic syndrome. And we are particularly interested in understanding this because we have a history in looking at CAL4 ligases in particular and trying to understand um, their mode of action. So 
what um, the Handa Lab um, initiated and, and, and the targets that have been identified uh, in the field suggest is that in the presence of these drugs, you suddenly get a drug-induced gain of function where a protein-protein interaction is induced. Um, so this drug does make two proteins bind. It makes uh, you know, a casein kinase 1 alpha or e allos bind to the CRBN surface um, with the help of the drug, uh, which then juxtaposes it to the RBX1, uh, which binds an E2 loaded ubiquitin conjugate and uh, transfers ubiquitin onto the substrate for degradation. Um, and Georg Petzold, when he joined the lab, um, was really interested in how this complex looks like and how uh, you can induce these types of interaction. Um, and uh, he really took this to town in a structural function uh, manner uh, where he was first able to solve the structure of casein kinase 1 alpha, which in the presence of one of these imides, lenalidomide, is bound to CRBN, the DDB1 ligase receptor, um, really gluing this uh, kinase in this case through a better hairpin onto the surface of the ligase um, for degradation. Georg then went on and asked the question, well, this works for casein kinase 1 alpha, but how does this work um, for other targets, in particular for transcription factors? And my lab has a big interest in genome maintenance machines and regulation, and we're really puzzled by this because we couldn't see um, what possibly a zinc finger transcription factor has in common um, with a kinase. But um, Georg came to the rescue, and it was ultimately also um, uh, confirmed by uh, Phil Chamberlain's uh, group at, at Celgene, uh, identifying that in those zinc fingers, there's a better hairpin loop uh, present that although not conserved in sequence, that's why we didn't find it, although not conserved in sequence, is very much concerned in structure and mimics these kinds of motifs. And Georg then went on to solve the structure of Icarus and 7F692, uh, bound to CRBN in the presence of pomalidomide, um, revealing a binding mode that was very similar to that of casein kinase 1 alpha. And this binding mode really got us thinking because there, there weren't any uh, very pronounced interactions between the target, in this case, Icarus or CK1 alpha, and the receptor or the compound involved in this. So most interactions were not sequence specific, they were backbone specific. And that's a real problem in the context of the zinc fingers because the, the overall fold of a zinc finger is very conserved. You can almost pick and choose different zinc fingers out of the database and they will have a similar backbone conformation. Um, yet we suspected, and, and that was supported by the literature, there's some level of specificity in the system. So together with Ben Ebert's uh, lab at the uh, now the Dana Faber and the Broad um, and a fabulous uh, PhD student of his, Quinn Sivers, we, we try to figure out what the specificity of CRBN really is for this zinc finger family. Um, they have this, this, wonderful, um, this wonderful screen uh, based on the LHGPS system, which basically fuses a zinc finger in frame to an EGFP reporter in the lentivirus. There's an M cherry um, independently expressed through an iris. Cells get transfected, compounds get added, and only those um, of the uh, 4,000 zinc fingers that we cloned into, or human zinc fingers, C2H2 zinc fingers, we cloned in the reporter that are really a substrate to CRBN in the presence of an image, those were degraded. Um, so we basically then sort um, degraded and non-degraded cells, uh, uh, sequence those, and do the data analysis. And that screen, which had a single zinc finger fused in frame to a GFP reporter, really worked beautifully. It identified um, 10 um, zinc finger constructs that in this reporter were quite avidly and robustly degraded in that system. Um, we then thought, okay, the, the, the ubiquitin field is a little bit obsessed for uh, the right reason with degrons, the concept of what makes a protein bind. And we really wanted to understand what the degron in that system could be. Um, so we thought, okay, we're going to take those sequences, we're going to align them, and out will come the degron. So we did exactly that. We took those 10 sequences. There was uh, one more we subsequently found on bio, based on bioinformatic approaches. We aligned these 10 sequences. Uh, we looked at conservation. 
But these conserved stripes that you see over here are not parts of the, the protein protein interface, but they are rather part of the zinc finger fold that you need. You have the two histines, the two histines is leucine here. Um, is, is involved too. Only the glycine is a residue that really gets very close um, to, uh, to the compound and we would understand why any larger group at this side, at least in our hand with these scaffolds um, causes a clash. So it didn't answer the Dagon question at all. If anything, it made it worse because to cut a really long story short, we um, we, we realized that actually there are some residues uh, here at this position preceding the cysteine, the first cysteine over here, where if you take, for example, the Q of ZNF692 and craft it onto the position of the E in, in E4F1 um, uh, zinc finger, you suddenly uh, lose degradation. So there was an element of epistasis where there wasn't a fixed degron, but, but the degrons only worked in a certain context. And the, the other level of complication that we saw, um, because this question of, of non-productive uh, degradation came up, we quite clearly saw um, through um, rather complicated and complex prediction algorithms followed by a lot of really painful, but, but I think uh, insightful biochemistry, we found that there are many, many zinc fingers. We estimate around 150, 200 um, that are bound, that have some sizable measurable affinity for um, this particular zinc finger CIBN complex, but only the top part of the peak of the, the iceberg is being, is being degraded. And we have a couple of examples for, for the zinc fingers and one uh, for the uh, kinase inhibitors in the second part of the talk, for if you drop the affinity of the, uh, the target by between two to five fold, you can toggle a very actively degraded protein into a non-degraded protein. We don't think it's KD only, it's probably more complicated than that, but the structure activity relationship in this system is clearly not your usual kind of MedChem problem, but there's some sort of step function in this um, where if you cross a certain threshold, you're going to get degraded. Um, and which of course means that these proteins that bind but are not degraded, they will be good substrate, um, as Fleur already told you, for, for subsequent development processes. So we think the system works like this. You have CRBN, it binds an imid compound. There are a couple of zinc fingers. Many of them have some kind of um, affinity but only those that sort of fit the mold um, will be able to bind with high affinity, um, which is also the reason um, for thalidomide specificity for cell, four, uh, cell four, um, which um, if you know the history of thalidomide, it was initially introduced not as a cancer therapeutic, uh, but as a sleeping aid and, and turned out to be highly teratogenic. And it's most likely at least in part cell four um, as shown by work from Eric Fisher's lab um, and cell gene that is responsible for that. Also a zinc finger that also fits that particular mold. So what we think is happening is that certain residues, um, because it's a 3D degron of a zinc finger sitting in the pocket, certain residues are tolerated in certain scaffolds, but, but only those scaffolds that really fit criteria on both sides of the binding pocket, they are really degraded degrees. But the exciting question forward looking for us is we know that the, there's a, there's a, there are many degraded zinc fingers, but only the top fraction of the iceberg is being degraded. So if we have compounds that slightly change the binding profile, can you degrade new zinc fingers? Um, and that worked beautifully uh, in, in uh, repeating the screen work by Mikola Slabiki um, in Ben's lab, repeating the same screen that you've seen with the same reporters, but now with different compounds. We could see that the images are still intrinsically polypharmacological, uh, um, but now have the ability to, um, to dial in degradation of certain zinc fingers while dialing out degradation of others. So we did the zinc finger specificity can be tuned by the compound. And that's something that we're very interested in and where we're developing novel assays now and, and hopefully we'll, able, we'll be able to what we call break the image code and understand this a little bit better what the correlation is between those two factors. Okay. 
So in this project about CRBN, we always ask ourselves the question, because this is so amazing that these things really work, that you can reprogram specificity with an image. We really ask ourselves the question, um, how can this be? And one answer is there could be an endogenous molecule um, that of course we're looking for, um, but haven't found yet. There could be an endogenous molecule that is like an image and it recruits um, uh, similar looking proteins, zinc fingers or kinases to, to, to CRBN for degradation. Um, we, I, I, stopped, I start to believe this is not the case, but I'm very happy to explain to you why. The other option that, I, that, is growing fond, that I'm growing fond upon is that maybe proteins are much, it's much easier to make two proteins stick than we, than we typically anticipated. Um, and the, the one piece of the puzzle comes from Deepak's work identifying RBM39 um, binding to DCAP15 in the presence of indisulam, uh, for which we also know the mechanism and which also is such a compound induced interaction. In this case, the interface is absolutely not conserved, uh, making it a little bit unlikely that this is an evolutionary evolved interaction. So, okay, we said with, uh, with Ben and Mikoy and, and Georg and Susanna in my lab. So, okay, if this is not, if this is, a, um, if this is something that proteins do in the presence of compound, can we find other examples for such a reaction? And it's not so straightforward to do this. Um, Georg Winter has recently published a, a fantastic screen to do this. Um, we did this more on the bioinformatics side in that we, um, we looked um, in the PRISM data set of around 5,000 compounds of the broad um, for, for any kind of correlation between drug killing and components of ubiquitin ligase. And um, these are the actual correlation. It didn't look fantastic and we had to test a couple, but we felt that there, there's some kind of relationship. And I would like to show you one example that we're particularly excited about. So we found this compound CR8, uh, which was known to be a kinase inhibitor, which showed some kind of killing of cells as a function of DDB1 uh, levels. And we, we then, um, together with Eric Fisher's help um, and Catherine Donovan, who Fleur introduced to you also, we basically looked at um, cycling, uh, we, we, we did proteomics and asked the question, who could CR8 uh, degrade in this case? And it turned out that cyclin K is degraded by, uh, by CR8. You can do this in Western blots also. And we had a perfect control because CR8 has a sister compound called roscovidin. And uh, this roscovidin um, misses the phenylpyrigidin moiety over here and um, turned out to be not such a molecular glue degrader as CR8. Um, you know, uh, Mikoy, for, for those of you who know him, is really the, the, the master of these uh, um, proteomics, uh, these uh, genetic screen systems. He was able to um, set up a screen uh, based on CRISPR resistance as well as reporter screens and was able to identify those components which belong to a cul 4 ubiquitin ligase. So we found the CDK um, that uh, CR8 bound to, we found cyclin K as being the target, we found DDB1, we found CAL4B, we found RBX1 and the nettilation machinery. But what we didn't found, find, and that was a big issue for us, um, as also already uh, Shaipal introduced in this, um, in this talk, was a substrate receptor. We didn't find a substrate receptor and all colons have substrate receptors. And so we kept looking for a substrate receptor really hard for about a year and couldn't find it. Um, and um, we reached a point at which we thought, okay, let's see how far we get without a substrate receptor. And that's the work of Georg Petzold and Susanna Kozika in my lab, a PhD student um, has been driving these efforts together with Georg. Um, and they were able to crystallize the complex of DDB1, CDK12 and cyclin K. Um, and that's really a fantastic structure that showed us that um, the, how the compound, in this case CR8, acts as a molecular glue. It glues, in this case, the kinase to DDB1. And exactly this uh, phenylpyridine moiety that was absent in roscovidin, which is not such a um, molecular glue degrader, but simply an inhibitor, that was the key moiety required to confer this type of glue functionality. 
Um, so what we think is happening is that um, when we compare Georg's CK1 CRVN lenalidomide complex with um, the CR8 um, culling ling, ling ligase, you, you might anticipate, uh, appreciate even not being a, a structural biologist that the CRBN position here on this particular ligase is taken up by CDK12. So we are dealing with a compound induced glue activity between the kinase and DDB1. And then the cyclin, cyclin K gets put in a position equivalent to that of CK1 alpha in CRBN, uh, where it's targeted by uh, a ubiquitin loaded um, E2. And there's uh, some beautiful work from Brenda Schumann, for example, that, that now illustrates how these kinds of culling ring ligase E2 transfers work in a, in a flexible way. So this is a drug induced near substrate where the drug actually makes CDK a substrate receptor, something that we, we never possibly anticipated. So if one takes a step, thing, a step and thinks about this, yes, we do think that it's actually much easier to make uh, proteins bind than at least I previously anticipated. And of course, hindsight is always um, 2020. And one of these examples I already learned in, in my first uh, course in biochemistry, and that is sickle cell anemia, um, where a glutamate to a valine mutation is disease causing um, and basically confers a hemoglobin into a fiber. So it's a very small surface change that changes the aggregation state um, of hemoglobin um, in, in, a, in a disease relevant setting. And there's a beautiful study doing something similar, but, but in, a, in, a, um, in a genetic screening approach uh, in cells work from Emmanuel Levy's lab showing that surface mutation introduced in a number of proteins can actually very readily and very happily change their aggregation state, um, conferring new complex formation. And the idea that Emmanuel has put out there is that proteins really evolve at the cost of forming these types of complexes. They're sort of, they might be, they might be touching each other, they might not be actionable uh, complexes. But if you, if you look at the right panel, there might be some interactions that are anyway a little bit complementary already, but might not be actionable biologically. Um, but with the right small molecule, you might be able to induce glue functionality in this. And this will go, we think, way beyond um, targeted degradation. And we're pretty confident that many other drugs that are out there and that you can buy in the pharmacy um, will have similar effects. So you have to watch that space. We're, of course, of course very interested in, in trying to figure this out and, and trying to conceptualize this and, and trying to have a better understanding also about you know, the basic biology of interfaces, because our interface concept is still very much um, um, a Fisher type, uh, Emil Fisher, not Eric Fisher in this case, um, 1892 lock and key sort of concept. And we think that this is arguably a little bit more complicated and that maybe with small molecule tools, we can get to uh, understanding and dissecting that. That's it. Um, very grateful to wonderful lab and fantastic collaborators. Georg, Susanna have been driven these efforts um, to, to, together with Mikoy and um, uh, all the people listed here. We had a fantastic collaboration with Ben and Eric, uh, and I thank them and I thank this for feasible funding for your attention. Thank you, Nico, very much. So with structure comes understanding almost an infamy to ask you to press this all in a 15 minute talk so very sorry for that there are already some questions in the q and a so we will come to them at the end of the session but you can already have a look at them our uh, next speaker uh, in sorry next speaker in the second session is chris de Savi. And um, first time uh, Chris and me bumped into each other we were at an AACR meeting and we both tried to uh, get a seating space. So usually at those meetings, chemistry meetings are in the smallest rooms. Chris had the benefit that he was actually the speaker. So he didn't need a uh, seating space. He was talking about estrogen receptor degraders at that time at a different company, but um, from the title, you can already see that he was early on interested in small molecule degraders. Today, he comes to us uh, from his new company or more recent company, Chimera, and is going to talk about assessing new pharmacology based on a different type of small molecule degraders.
Just bear with me. Don't worry. Just bear with me. It looked quite good. Something. Yeah, bear with me. I've lost my talk. Hmm. It was looking good. Tell me if you can see it now. Can yes. you see everything now? Yes. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry for that, that brief technical issue. So yeah, I had a strong interest in targeted protein degradation before I joined Chimera Therapeutics. Um, and, you know, as Ingo just said, I was developing um, some of the first oral estrogen receptor degraders at, at AstraZeneca. So uh, that sort of tweaked my interest in, in, in moving um, into this field. So today I'm going to talk about kind of just very briefly two targets from Chimera, that is selective IRAC4 and STAT3 targeted protein degraders. And what I wanted to do was just maybe give you a, a, just a very quick intro. This is not a company um, you know, kind of selling platform, but I just wanted to say what we're doing at Chimera because it kind of sets a context to the, to the two targets that I'm talking about. So, you know, we're, we're pioneering a new modality called targeted protein degradation. Um, I mean, I think it's really special because it, it destroys proteins. It, it just doesn't inhibit them. That's what I spent most of my career on, inhibiting proteins. Um, well, I think it's really attractive as well. It does not require targeting of, of, of you know, small molecule active sites. And I think people forget that, you know, you, you only need to find binders. And, you know, if you, if you understand the vectors and you can recruit the right E3 ligases, you don't need to be targeting active sites, which are like most small molecule drugs out there. And what's really nice about this modality and, you know, the formation of ternary complexes instead of binary complexes you know, it's really a highly selective and, and, and targeted approach. And it's part of a reason why I got into it. But for us at Chimera, it can be used to drug previously undruggable targets like transcription factors. And we have a strong interest in transcription factors and we have a pretty major program in STAT3, which I'm gonna talk about. But where it's also interesting is targeting proteins where scaffolding functions are really important. And IRAC4 is one of those targets um, that I'm also gonna talk about. So I'm just going to kind of present to you just very briefly our platform, which, which I could give a really large talk on, but it's only going to be one slide um, for today. So, you know, at Chimera, we've developed this platform, which we call Pegasus. Um, it's allowing us to understand the relationship between E3 ligases and target proteins to essentially identify the properties that make a target both ligandable and degradable. And clearly, you know, all of those factors that impact potency, selectivity, and PKPD. The real key components of this platform combine our understanding, actually, of the localization and expression of E3 ligases and combining that with our E3 ligase binders toolbox. So, you know, something which I won't be able to present today, Chimera is really interested in um, designing and discovering tissue selective E3 ligases you know, which we hope to combine with sort of proteins of interest where, you know, maybe targeted by the small molecule approach has called toxicity because of, you know, wide tissue distribution. So if you can actually identify an E3 ligase that's only present in the tissues that you want to de degrade in and those tissues where you don't want to, we think this is going to be a really attractive approach and something which is probably differentiating from Chimera to other companies. So just a bit of an introduction to what we're doing and maybe an introduction to the targets that we're working on. So our pipeline's pretty rich. Um, it's focused on undressing, you know, patient unmet need in both inflammation and oncology disease. And our initial programs target IRAC4, Aracamid, and STAT3. IRAC4 is a pure degrader of IRAC4, whereas with Aracamid, it degrades not only IRAC4, but some of the neo substrates such as Icaros and Ilios. And it's very, very unique that you need that sort of, you know, dual mechanism in Arachamid to see activity in, in models such as the LBCL. Whereas for inflammation, you do not need to degrade these neo substrates to see that activity. That is super interesting. And we'll talk about that probably at another stage. So these sort of diseases center on critical signaling nodes um, within the IL-1 TLR pathway and also the JAK stat pathway. And I'm gonna be talking about JAK. Um, I don't wanna talk about all of the other um, programs that we have, but we have a pretty rich pipeline of novel discovery programs. 
and pretty significant collaborations with both Sanofi and Vertex. It's worth noting the, the sort of collaborations that we have with Vertex focus essentially on degraded programs outside of information and oncology. And as most of you know, you know if you're working on degraders, it, it's pretty much a disease agnostic platform, um, especially dependent on the E3 ligases that, that you're focusing on. So maybe just moving on now to IRAC for biology and why we think a degrader rationale is superior to just inhibiting um, IRAC4 as a kinase, because there's a lot of IRAC4 kinase inhibitors out there already and some in the clinic. So IRACs are key mediators of the TLR and IL1R signaling processes. And TLR and IL1 mediated signaling controls, you know, a diverse set of cell processes, including inflammation, apoptosis, and cell differentiation. Clearly, you know, that is why we're working in sort of inflammation and also oncology disease. So upon binding of IL1R by IL1 family cytokines, Mighty 88 is rapidly recruited to the receptor by this TR domain. And then Mighty 88 then recruits IRAC4. Mighty 88, IRAC4, and IRAC2 form this large complex called the mitosome. And then, you know, biologically, this recruits and phosphorylates IRAC1, which leads to recruitment of TRAF6. And if you go downstream, this leads to downstream activation of both, of both junk and this NF kappa beta pathways. So what we know and what we've at least proven here preclinically at Chimera is that IRAC4 inhibition alone only actually targets the kinase activation pathway. And this does not impact the mitosome architecture. Degradation, however, removes IRAC4 completely. And this also removes a scaffolding function, which causes a mitosome to fall apart. And we at least have some preclinical data, which I'll share with you over the next few slides, showing you that this mechanism has a much more profound effect um, versus an IRAC for um, kinase inhibitor, including clinical kinase inhibitors. So I, I'm really, I'm, I'm afraid we can't share the entire discovery story to KT474. So I'm just gonna share you the data of, of our development candidate. So this is our, our development candidate called KT474. It's a really potent and highly selective um, degrader of IRAC4. And the graph I've got here on the left-hand side is showing the degradation DC50 of about 2.1 nanomolar in human monocytes. On the right-hand side, these are the volcano plots I think you've seen in previous talks where we look at the degradation of, of our degraders. And you can see here that KT474 only degrades IRAC4 across 10,000 other proteins. And here at Chimera, we do these at concentrations tenfold above the DC90. You'll see a lot of other places that they'll do the DC50 or the DC90, but we really go at tenfold over just to you know, really understand um, if this is a real pure IRAC4 degrader. And this is essentially, this molecule is a very pure IRAC4 degrader. So maybe just to share with you some data which has kind of convinced us and convinced others that KT474 has shown superiority over other kinase inhibitors. And we've shown this in, in many, many in vitro inflammation assays. And the one I'm sharing with you today is this LPS, which is sort of like a TLR4 or an R848, TLR78, TLR agonist stimulation of human PBMCs. And what we've shown here with the data on the left-hand side and the right-hand side is that our degraders inhibit IL-6 at pretty potent levels. And at least in this setting here on the left-hand side, it is far superior to IRAC4 small molecule kinase inhibitors. What's also pretty interesting, it's data I'm not sharing today with you, but this trend also prevails and is very significant in also other signaling pathways such as TNF alpha inhibition. So, you know, this molecule also does exactly the same um, for TNF alpha inhibition. And this does actually speak to the fact that IRAC4 degradation is a superior mechanism to IRAC4, at least in inhibiting cytokine production, such as IL-6 in, in human PBMCs. So what we also do, as well as just these standard in vitro assays, we look at phosphorylation events upon TLR activation using its flow cytometry technique. And we, we more or less look at this for, for most of our programs. And what you can see here is that KT474, which I've highlighted in these, in these black boxes, inhibits phosphorylation events downstream of TLR stimulation in human PBMCs. 
And this effect is far superior to an IRAC-4 clinical kinase inhibitor, such as this Pfizer inhibitor, which is in the clinic. We've also profiled multiple other small molecule inhibitors of IRAC-4 to show that this is just not unique between you know, two match pairs. So how does some of this in vitro data you know, translate in vivo? We've run a lot of in vivo um, models for this IRAC-4 degrader. And just today I'm sharing with you this um, mouse psoriasis model, which is known as this amiquinoid skin mouse model. And what we've been able to show with this degrader is the oral administration of 474 at either 30 mg per kg or 100 mg per kg in this skin mouse model of psoriasis, what you can actually see is a, is a, a significant decrease in skin thickening compared to the vehicle, which is kind of in gray on the left-hand side. And this is also very comparable to topical corticosteroids, which you probably are well aware are, are sort of, you know, standard of care and standard of treatment for psoriasis. So we're seeing at least this 30 mg per kg, a lot more significant impact in being able to reduce this, this, this ear um, thickening. What we're able to also monitor in these models is the level of IRAC for knockdown. And, and as we're going in vivo, we tend to look at multiple tissues. So we look at skin and spleen here, and we're able to achieve 60 to 70% knockdown of IRAC4 in both skin and spleen, um, which is really interesting, which is giving us this sort of impact in this model here. So we've dosed 474 now into both rat and dog 14 day non GLP studies, and we've also undertaken PKPD studies. And what we've seen here is almost complete knockdown of IRAC-4 has been demonstrated across multiple tissues and multiple doses, even as low as 10 mg per kg in dogs. And just to let you know, this compound is very well tolerated uh, um, up at 600 mg per kg in rats and up to 100 mg per kg in dogs. And this data has given us a lot of confidence about the potential, comp about the potential of this compound to progress into the clinic. And we will be dosing this compound into the clinic in the first half of 2021 for um, patients suffering from hiderinitis um, suppurativa. So now very quickly onto STAT3, this is our true sort of undruggable target here at Chimera. And just a bit of brief background on STAT3, it's a transcription factor member of the STAT family and a little bit about the biology. In response to cytokines and growth factors, STAT3 is phosphorylated by the JAKs upon which STAT3 forms this dimer. Um, this is then translocated into the nucleus and binds to DNA to regulate transcription. As many of you may know, STAT3 is frequently mutated in, in numerous cancers, in, including hematological mal malignancies, and it also plays a role in inflammation and fibrosis. And, you know, really potent and selective STAT3 inhibitors have remained elusive to date, um, you know, mostly because the STAT3 protein is large and it's actually quite difficult to drug. So we're trying to make and design and discover first-in-class opportunities to address this, um, what we still see as an undruggable target. So as I mentioned, STAT3 is a large protein and it's difficult to drug, but we've been able to achieve this um, you know, very, very selectively as well. So our chimera degraders strongly bind to STAT3. They form these ternary complexes, which we can monitor in these alpha lysa assays. We can also monitor this polyubiquitination and also we monitor the, the degradation effect. And for this particular degrader, there's a very nice dose response of, of degradation. And what we also do, which is common in, in this field is also make up these negative controls um, where the, the degrader itself is unable to bind to the E3 ligase just to understand whether it's dependent um, on the E3. So just on this next slide, I'd like to show you that KTX201, which is one of our most advanced compounds, causes rapid potent degradation of STAT3 in these hematological cell lines, SUDHL1 and SUPM2. So in addition, KTX201, we've proven that it rep represses growth also in these cell lines. And you know plots that I've shown you previously for RAC4, this also demonstrates very selective degradation in both human PBMCs, which we see as sort of like our healthy tissues and a hematological cell line, SUDHL1. And what's really interesting is that this is a very selective degrader versus all other STAT3, STAT, other STAT family members, which was kind of shown up in, in blue in these two graphs. So 201 causes rapid, potent, and selective degradation of STAT3 in multiple cellular systems. So this is some data I've been sharing for the first time, or I shared it for the first time at our last at the last conference I spoke at. So, you know, most people think protein degraders are large, very lipophilic, maybe not soluble. This is very different for this particular molecule. 
So KTX201 is actually highly soluble. I mean, we're, we're seeing up to 30 mg per mil in aqueous media at pH 7.4, which is quite remarkable. This is a particularly stable degrader in multiple species, so human, rat, dog, and monkey. And we've been able to dose this to, to these species and see very low clearance, um, moderate half-life, driven primarily by a low volume of distribution, which makes this molecule very attractive to be dosed by the IV route. So just a little bit about mechanism. In SUDHL1 cells, we've shown that 90% degradation is necessary to induce SUDHL1 apoptosis and inhibit cell growth inhibition, which is here on the left-hand side. We've also undertaken these sort of washout experiments, whereas at 48 hours, you'll see 48 hours of this sustained degradation is required for SUDHL1 cells to commit to death. Whereas at 24 hours, which is this upper right-hand side, you'll see that the cells have not fully committed to death there. And maybe the last few slides here, in vivo, we have actually dosed this compound um, to an SUDHL1 mouse xenograft model just once a week. And you'll see on day one, day eight, and day 15 that we've dosed this molecule, there's a very nice dose response and significant anti-tumor activity. And we start seeing significant tumor regression at 25 mg per kg, which is this red line here. At 50 mg per kg, this is a complete response from Mr. Grader across all eight animals with no further tumor growth seen after dosing on day 15. I think I'm running a little bit over time, so I'm just gonna probably just very quickly go over this slide and then, and then conclude. So here at Chimera, we look at PKPD, and I think this is extremely important, especially in in vivo setting, because in vitro does not always correlate to in vivo. So this is the PKPD data at five mix, 10 mix per kg and 25 mix per kg. And just let me orientate you to the plots on the y-axis on the left, is concentration in micromolar. On the right is, uh, and the y-axis is STAT3 PD and tumor. The open dark circles is plasma PK. The filled dark circles is tumor PK. In orange are the STAT3 levels. Maximal degradation of STAT3 in tumor occurs at 24 hours post-dose at all of these doses. What you'll see is that maximal degradation of greater than 90% was actually achieved at this 25 mg per kg dose, which we've actually seen those tumor regressions that you saw on the previous slide. But as you can see for the five and 10 mg per kg doses, there is, there is not a sustained degradation. You see it at 25 mg per kg, but you see this very quick recovery of STAT3 levels at five, 10 mg per kg. So within the limits of error, we're also seeing at 90% degradation for about, for about 48 hours, can lead to significant regressions in this tumor xenograft model. So just to end, I hope I've shown you that IRAC4, I'm just gonna briefly go through this. IRAC4 degradation is superior to inhibition. And I hope I've shared that with you over the, over the last few slides. Chimera has also developed some really potent and highly selective STAT3 degraders. And I hope I've shared with you that STAT3 degradation of 90% or greater leads to this apoptosis induction mechanism and we've been able to show that cancer cell death within 48 hours, both in vitro and in vivo. And I'm sorry, I think I've gone a few minutes over, Ingo, and I apologize for that. Don't worry, Chris. So we'll just add a few minutes at the end to still be able to cover some questions. So there are some questions in the Q&A box, but um, we will head on to, to the next speaker and then come back to Chris as we'll do to Nico uh, in the roundtable discussion. So our final speaker of the session will be Lindsay James. And I think it's fair to say that there can't be an SGC sponsored event without dedicating a full presentation to epigenetics. And I'm very happy that, that um, you accepted our invitation. So um, Lindsay from the University of North Carolina has been working on chemical probes for epigenetic targets for a number of years. And today she's gonna to share with us a story around using some of these probes to degrade targets. So please. All right, thank you, Ingo. Um, safe to assume you can see my slides okay? Um, okay, yes. let, let me know if not. Um, yeah, I, I'm really thrilled to be able to um, wrap up this webinar today. And um, I appreciate the invitation from the organizers to participate in what's been a really fantastic morning and I've so enjoyed listening. Um, to the other speakers today, and I know we are running a little behind, so I will do my best to get through this quickly. Um, so my lab um, is largely interested in chromatin, as Ingo alluded to, um, specifically post-translational modifications of histone proteins 
um, that serve as key signals for the regulation of chromatin structure, um, as well as DNA accessibility and therefore uh, gene expression. Um, so there are three key classes of proteins um, or chromatin regulatory factors um, that intimately work together to regulate these post-translational modifications. Um, there are the writers that enzymatically install post-translational modifications, uh, the erasers that remove those post-translational mo modifications, um, as well as the readers that recognize these post-translational modifications um, through protein-protein interactions and often um, bring along um, catalytic function through larger protein complexes that they recruit. Um, and so the problem, you know, the reason we study these, these classes of proteins is that um, in recent years, it's become abundantly clear that the dysregulation of epigenetic regulatory factor, factors um, is an emerging hallmark in disease, particularly in cancers. Um, and so there are examples of a disease associated overexpression, mutation, translocation, or aberrant recruitment of these proteins. Um, which regulate the epigenome. And so I, I clearly don't have to go into the details of chemical probes with this audience, um, but our solution to this problem is coming up with small molecule tools um, to really achieve three things, to increase the biological understanding of the targets and um, to validate novel targets for drug discovery and then um, think about potentially developing new therapeutics. And so specifically our expertise is in methylacine reader chemical probes. Um, and this is a family of proteins that, that read or bind methylated lysine residues through protein-protein interactions. Um, very similarly to how the well-known BET bromo domains, which we've heard about, um, read acetyl lysine. And so these methylacine reader domains generally bind both a specific lysine residue as shown um, on the right within a certain histone tail. And they also often have a preferred methylation state. So that might be monodi or trimethylacine. Um, and again, although these, and these domains don't necessarily have enzymatic activity themselves, they're often part of larger proteins or protein complexes, um, which are able to alter the PTM landscape um, through enzymatic activity. And so we think that, um, you know, although we've had um, a good bit of success developing chemical probes or traditional small molecules for um, some members of the methylacine reader family, um, we think that for a number of reasons that this is an ideal target class for protact development. Um, so first, methylacine readers are generally large multi-domain proteins. Um, and in advance, without specific point mutations and, and elaborate genetic studies, we often lack knowledge of the best domain to target with small molecules in order to elicit the desired biological effect. Um, similarly, these, these proteins containing reader domains often have multivalent interactions, um, recognizing different uh, post-translational modifications, sometimes some simultaneously anchoring these proteins and protein complexes to chromatin. And so it can be difficult um, you know, for antagonism of a single reader or post-translational modification interaction um, to phenocopy uh, genetic knockdown results. Um, methylacine readers are often difficult drug targets um, for many reasons. They don't often have this deep um, binding pocket and they often recognize uh, histone proteins through surface groove um, interactions. And so often traditional approaches um, that require um, high target occupancy have been challenging. And so last, as I alluded to, methylacine readers often contain a catalytic domain um, or recruit protein complexes um, with enzymatic activity. So by um, degrading the reader protein, we can often um, allosterically regulate uh, histone methyltransferase activity. Um, so as I mentioned, we're really thinking about using methylacine reader targeted protax as, as a way to allosterically regulate uh, histone methyltransferase activity. Um, and so in the remaining time, I'm going to just touch on two projects where we've been successful in doing this. And the first uh, was led by um, Frankie Pachewood, who was a former postdoc and now a postdoc at SGC UNC. Um, and we're interested in um, degrading polychrome repressive complex two. Um, uh, over about 10 years ago, um, EZH2, the H3K27 trimethylmethyltransferase was shown to be overexpressed um, and gain of function mutants were identified in a number of different tumor types. Um, so we and others have looked at chemical probes that, that block EZH2 catalytic activity and lead to a loss of K27 trimethyl. Um, and a number of these compounds are, are currently in the clinic. 
Um, about five years ago, it was shown that EED allosterically regulates EZH2. Um, this is a methylacine reader domain, which recognizes the product of um, EZH2 catalytic activity. So it binds H3K27 trimethyl. Um, and again, chemical probes that block EED are able to um, reduce H3K27 trimethyl. Um, and so Frankie was interested in um, taking a, a protein um, targeted de degradation approach to see if we're able to degrade um, a single or multiple members of PRC2. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all the medicinal chemistry, but she identified UNC6852, which has this short alkyl linker linking um, a, a, an EED ligand, EED226, or a close analog to um, a ligand for BHL. Um, and we produce both active and inactive um, um, compounds by just altering the stereochemistry at the hydroxyl on the proline. And we were able to show that 6852 in HeLa cells degrades all key members of PRC2, so EZH2, EED, and SUS12, even though we're just targeting BHL um, through an EED, uh, an EED ligand. And we moved um, next into a, a more relevant um, DLBCL cell line where uh, that contains an EZH2 mutant. Um, and this work was published earlier this year in Cell Chemical Biology, so I won't go through all of the details. But we do um, see in this cell line, we see a dose-dependent response of um, EZH2 degradation as well as EED degradation and SUS12. Um, and this degradation leads to a loss in methylation over time, um, similarly to the small molecules, um, as well as a um, anti-proliferative effect in DB and FIFR cells. Um, so we think that um, PRC2 targeted degraders may be attractive um, as a complementary strategy to the compounds that are already in the clinic, um, somewhat due to the potential to overcome acquired resistance that's been observed with EZH2 inhibitors. Um, and also this was the first example of targeted degradation of a methylacine reader protein, as well as an entire protein complex. Um, and while we hadn't intended to pursue this too much further, while we were preparing the publication, um, Frankie did make a few more compounds. Um, and she made these um, compounds containing uh, cycloalkane cyclic, you know, these cycloalkane linkers, both in a cis and trans conformation. And we were really intrigued to see that only one of these two conformations was able to degrade the components of PRC2, kind of reiterating that subtleties in, in these linkers, which we've heard a bit about, um, can really influence degradation. We were also excited to see that this next generation compound had really potent DC50s below 50 nanomolar, um, and at lower doses seemed to be more effective at reducing methylation um, than our first generation compound. And so we're currently thinking about how to better understand some of these subtle differences in degradation, uh, these subtle differences in structure and how it leads to a drastic difference in degradation. Um, and so this is a work in progress, but um, earlier this year we published uh, in collaboration with Stephen Fry an assay to look at permeability of um, bivalent chemical degraders. Um, and so we kind of first turned to this to see if we could assess the permeability of these two degraders as this is um, you know, a requirement for effective degradation. And so briefly the way this assay works, um, it, was, it was initially um, published by the Kritzer lab at Tufts. Um, and there's a halo tag anchored to the mitochondrial membrane. Um, and you first treat with a chloro tag um, labeled molecule, so protac of interest. And um, this is a pulse chase assay. And then you, you chase with a um, chloro tag dye. And so therefore the fluorescence intensity is proportional to the amount of the unreacted halo tag and inversely related to uh, penetration of the chloro tag molecule. And so we can just look at these relative CP50 values um, to look at the concentration at which 50% of um, cell penetration is observed. And um, we got a fairly striking result when looking at these truncated molecules. So the EED ligand with the linker and then this chloro tag, so not the full protax but we found that the cis analog was more than a thousand times more permeable um, than the trans. And so we think this might be one explanation um, for the difference between these, these two molecules that um, it may be related to cell uh, penetration or, or permeability. Um, and we're also currently looking at, at ternary complex and some of these other components that um, Fleur nicely discussed um, to better understand or get a full picture of you know, why certain molecules degrade when other close analogs do not. 
Um, and so from here, I'm going to switch gear and just briefly talk about one other protein that we're interested in. Um, and this is NSD2, which, which is an H3K36 dimethyl reader and methyl transferase involved in multiple myeloma. Um, this, re, this protein has multiple reader domains, two different, P, two different PWWPs and a number of PhD domains, as well as a set domain um, to install this um, K36 dimethyl mark. Um, and so one reason that we were interested in this uh, target is due to the fact that um, 15 to 20% of multiple myeloma patients carry a translocation um, that leads to NSD2 overexpression, um, resulting in upregulation of this PTM and, and inappropriate activation of oncogenes. Um, and to date, efforts to robustly target the catalytic domain have been unsuccessful. Um, so this project has been an ongoing collaboration with the Structural Genomics Consortium, um, and this slide summarizes a few years of medicinal chemistry leading to um, a chemical probe for the N-terminal PWWP domain. Um, as you can see here, this has a KD of about 80 nanomolar and um, a cellular IC50 of one micromolar. And it binds in this methylacine reader pocket where the K36 dimethyl mark um, binds. Um, and so we were able to show um, that UNC6934 selectively binds the PWWP1 domain um, within the PWTB family and proteome-wide by proteomics. Um, and it also potently engages this domain in cells, whereas a structurally similar negative control does not. Um, and we weren't overly surprised to see that um, antagonism of this N-terminal PWWP domain um, is not sufficient to influence global H3K36 methylation levels, likely due to the fact that you have all of these other domains that are still anchoring this protein on chromatin. Um, and while we didn't see changes in methylation, um, David Dilworth, a former postdoc um, at the SGC, did a lot of elegant studies showing that the compound still does something. Um, and while I won't go into all the details, uh, we do see that PWWP1 antagonism promotes nucleolar localization of NSD2. Um, so he, uh, David performed some confocal microscopy looking at NSD2 and fibrillarin, a common um, nucleolus stain, um, and showing that the compound did influence um, the ability of the of NSD2 to localize um, to the nucleus and um, it increased the nucleolar localization. And so not surprisingly, our next step as, as chemical biologists and medicinal chemists was to think about, you know, how, how can we use this molecule um, to result in a uh, phenotype that more closely um, reflects um, inhibition of the catalytic domain. And so um, what we did is we took our chemical probe, um, appended a number of different linkers as well as E3 ligands, um, and we've been able to successfully use our reader chemical probe um, to develop uh, NSD2 degraders as, as shown here by the, the degradation profile. And again, this was in close collaboration with Cheryl Aerosmith's group at, at the SGC. Um, and in contrast to our small molecule, we are able to show that the NSD2 degraders can reduce global H3K36 methylation levels. Um, and this is a work in progress um, to um, look at the effects of NSD2 degradation in uh, multiple myeloma. Um, and so with that, I've tried to point out um, a, a few people that have worked on this, but uh, Ronan Hanley led the men chem efforts in my lab on, on NSD2, and Frankie did um, all the work on, on PRC2. Um, we have a number of great collaborators, and I will, I will cut it off there. Thank you, Lindsay, very much. Yes, NSD2 is also one of those targets many in the industry are waiting for to see a small molecule to recapitulate what the genetic knockdown was promising. So great to see this work. Um, we are probably going a few minutes over time, but I would still um, try to cover some questions and ask the three P uh, speakers to, to join me in the discussion. I would start with, with Lindsay. So um, you alluded to um, the EED uh, degrader and that you then see degradation also of the other PLC2 complex um, members. Um, were you able to look more into the details? Is this kind of a subsequent effect or is there primary ubiquitination directly also of the other uh, uh, complex members or is the complex just unstable if you degrade one of the elements? Yeah, there are obviously multiple scenarios that you can envision. Um, we did do a little bit of work trying to look at ubiquitolation of EZE2 and EED as well as SUS12 to see if each component was being ubiquitolated because, you know, 
based on the structure, you know, these three core members are really closely intertwined. So you can envision that um, the PROTAC could potentially ubiquitolate, you know, their lysine's close enough on EZH2, um, even though we're not using an EZH2 ligand. But um, we did not get robust enough results to feel confident in presenting those um, in our publication. So we don't really know. I mean, you can also imagine that once you degrade EED, um, the complex might fall apart and that leads to degrade, you know, abundance of these proteins that are not in PRC2 any longer and that leads to, to degradation. So long story short is, is we don't really know the mechanistic details, but we are very interested. Okay, there's a closely related question to Chris about his work on IREC4 uh, degraders. So what about other components of the mitosome when you degrade I IREC4? So do you see then effects on IREC2 or other components? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question, actually. So for us, we, so we, we clearly don't degrade IREC2 um, because, you know, our molecules, we can actually monitor that. So we don't, and we've actually looked in cells, so we don't degrade IREC2, for example, or other IREC components. But by degrading IRAC4, um, you don't actually form a mitosome complex anymore. So, you know, it, it does impact IRAC2 because it doesn't form that mitosome complex. We haven't actually monitored IRAC2 um, levels. Um, we, we mostly focus on, on IRAC4. But it, if the question is around, do you impact IRAC2? Yes, of course, because, you know, the biological mechanism, you know, is recruiting to form a mitosome, Mighty 88 forms this mitosome complex. If you remove IRAC4, you can't form a mitosome complex anymore. Let's follow up with another question to you, Chris. So it's probably the $1 billion question for many in the field. So what level of binding affinity do you like to demonstrate before progressing to develop a degrader? Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. And I wish I could give a straight answer and give people a number. Um, you know, we've had different experiences. We're working across a lot of novel E3 ligases now. And, and you know, before I start with some numbers, because I can kind of give you a feeling of some ranges, I think it's really important before you embark on E3 ligase or novel E3 ligase drug discovery that you have in your arsenal sort of assays to measure ternary complexes. You have assays to measure ubiquitination. And obviously you have assays to measure degradation. I think where people get stuck in, in, in this field is that you know that they'll either make ligands for a new E3 ligase, make a degrader and then go straight to a degradation assay and go, gee, we're not seeing degradation. And that's, um, you know, I would say that's a, that's a really big error in this field that you should be monitoring, you should be looking, um, you know. So with E3 ligases, We've had um, mixed experiences. Um, normally, if your E3 ligase has a binding affinity, and, and, I, and I'm just going to be obvious here of above 10 micromolar, if you go ahead and take that E3 ligase binder and try to make degraders, you're going to have real trouble um, trying to get ternary complex formation, ubiquitination. That's our experience. But if you can make binders that are sort of sitting between the 5 and 10 micromolar range, and when I say binding, I mean, that could be anything. That could be sort of like an HDRF assay, for example, or even SBR binding. There's lots of ways that, that I'm sure everyone here knows that you can measure binding. But if you're in that range, it can be, it can be a good green light to, to at least make some probe molecules. But again, I'm going to go back to the point of ternary complex formation, ubiquitination. You know, with linkers, you know, you can, you can really design, and we've seen this on our IRAC4 and STAT3 program, depend on how you design those linkers and you know, whether they're constrained or flexible, you can see dramatic impacts in degradation and ubiquitination. Um, here at Chimera, I would say, I'd say it's more a rule of thumb. We like to get between the one and five micromolar in binding, at least for E3 ligases, at least in that range before we would embark on making degraders. But again, I wouldn't wanna write in a journal and say that that is absolutely the rule. But again, I would, I, would, I would reinforce you need those kind of um, ternary complex formation assays. Um, you need to understand whether your E3 ligases are actually got cell activity as well. A lot of people are making molecules that don't actually get into cells. So, you know, having 
you know, those nano brat, brat assays, which we use here to understand um, cell target engagement is really important as well. And I know that's a long answer, but it's a, it's a complicated question. I don't, I think just coming out with a number is probably not the right way to answer it. I think it's a question we are all struggling in this field and also maybe not overdoing it because I think we more and more understand that you want to have some wriggle room also for the ternary complex to form. So if you end up with too strong binding on both ends, it may also be not uh, productive in the end. Um, uh, several questions for Nico, and I will start with, with one. Is there something special about the cooling ring ligase for um, a family, or is it more a coincidence that the majority of glues seem to come from that family? I think that's a great question. So you also, you're talking to the head of the Culpo Ligase Fan Club, so I, the, the answer will be very partial. Um, so um, obviously, um, target degradation works with ligases other than Cal4. Um, so, but I think what's the closest proxy to targeted protein degradation is viral hijack, and that also works with other ligases um, than, than Cal4. But it mostly the, the examples I know are mostly culling ring ligases, and again, in these cases, Cal4 is is among the top hits. So. The advantage that Cal4 has over other ligase systems is that the CDB1 arm is kind of flexibly attached to, um, to the culling ring ligase and can probably scan a larger range of sites. So um, I'm, I'm usually think um, that lysine accessibility is not the biggest problem in, in this space and, and, um, and, and particularly not for Cal4s. So maybe that's why it's not a problem for, for the things that we touch. Um, so I think the, the, the CAL4s have the added advantage of having a larger range of ubiquitination uh, hot zone to, to go and target lysine. So that could be an advantage. So I think they certainly work well, but they're not the only ones, but I'm pretty sure they are, they're pretty high up. It's no coincidence that palidomide and other drugs work, work with CAL4s. Maybe a related question would be around the physiological role of those E3 ligases. Do, do you expect that at some point in time we will find some primary human metabolites acting as glues? Yes, I do. Um, and <laughs> we're looking for that. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, um, so when Ibert and I talk about, we feel like Arab uh, waiting for the white whale, I think, you know, but I, I'm looking at plants, which is the best thing to look at in this case, where there are 10 plus metabolites um, that mostly target ubiquitin ligases and mostly degrade transcription factors. Um, it, uh, yes, it would be very interesting to, to, to find that. And I'm, I'm sure it's out there. We just haven't found it yet. Um, I'm aware that we are running over time, but I would still like to take one more question for Lindsay. So there's a question about why did you choose NSD2 over NSD1 or NSD3? One could even extend the question. There are probably some more of these poly um, uh, proteins from epigenetics with unfulfilled promises. So where would you recommend to go next? Yeah, thank you. I was just trying to answer that in the chat. Um, I, um, it, it was somewhat of an unbiased approach. So we started um, looking at um, doing a, a virtual screen in collaboration with the SGC for the PWWP family um, because there are very few probes available. Though some have come out um, you know, in more recent years. So um, we did get a, um, a hit that we were interested in pursuing for again, the N-terminal PWWP domain of NSD2. Um, so in that regard, again, it, it was somewhat um, unbiased. However, um, you know, there is strong disease relevance in biology for NSD2. So that somewhat motivated us to continue um, down that path. And um, more recently, again, there have been potent probes published for other members of the NSD uh, family. So there, there are a lot of chemical tools that, that are available. Um, and thinking about readers more broadly, again, I think, you know, we're really interested in, in some of these readers that, you know, might, we might be able to identify a ligand for, but might not have, you know, um, a strong, uh, might not result in a, a strong biological effect, but knowing that they regulate other enzymatic activity or contain, you know, set domains or enzymatic activity within, um, the, the same protein, you know, it might be a way to, you know, allosterically um, inhibit these, 
these enzymes um, when inhibitors for the catalytic activity are, are not currently available. Okay, thank you very much. So it's already quite late in Asia. It's getting late in Europe and the colleagues in the US still need to get some work done, I guess. So all that remains um, for me to do is thank again six uh, excellent speakers uh, in this uh, packed session. Um, thanks to a lot of uh, great questions and um, don't miss out on the next webinar in this series. So it's going to be on the 11th of January, focusing on computational and AI methods. So also a quite hot topic. Um, but until then, so uh, most importantly, enjoy your uh, holiday season, stay safe, and then see you soon in 2021.